Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and in this video, I want to talk about asking questions. How do we get our students asking more questions, and how do we improve the quality of the questions that they're asking? This video is one of a set of videos on scientific inquiry, but asking questions is fundamental to that process. How do we understand and take into account the wonder of our students so we can help them build knowledge based on that? Now, I think asking questions is fundamental to what it is to be a human. This is a picture of me when I was a kid asking my mom tons of questions. Uh, it's how we learn. And I've learned as a teacher, it's important that you listen to the questions that your students are asking and understanding not only what are they asking, but how are they asking those questions? Because that wondering is really where they're learning. This is a quote from Mr. Rogers. It's in a song. He said, did you know when you wonder you're learning? Did you know when you marvel you're learning? Did you know when you wonder you're learning about wonderful, marvelous things? I have a website called The Wonder of Science, and the closest thing I have to a motto is don't kill the wonder. I think if we as teachers keep answering the questions that students ask, they'll eventually quit asking those questions. And so what I found when students ask questions is that their wonder is amazing, but their questions are not always amazing. We can help them improve the quality of the questions that they're asking. This is a phenomenon I showed in an earlier video. You ask two, you drop two spheres, they look the same. One of them bounces and the other one doesn't. I've asked this to hundreds of kids, so I have thousands of questions, and I've started looking through those questions looking for patterns. And what I found is the first word or two or three in the question they ask is sometimes the most important one. If they ask a question that starts with is or are or what, um, they're usually asking a pattern question. They want to know, is one of the spheres hollow? Is it sticky? These are observational type questions. It's just, um, what do they notice? However, if they have a qualifier, like is it affected by, or they ask questions that start with how or why, then they're trying to get to how does it work. These are cause and effect or structure and function type questions. I've also found that they tend to not ask questions related to systems. Where's the energy in the system go? How does the energy or how does the system remain stable? Or how does the system change over time? And we can help them start to ask questions like that. And so I've developed a set of inquiry cards. This would be the question one. And if you look on the back of it, it has two things. The first thing it has is a teaching sequence. And the second thing it has is a rubric. It's really important that you tell kids right away what makes a good scientific question. The first thing a good scientific question should do is address the phenomena. It, help, it should help to explain the phenomena that we're trying to understand, or if we're doing engineering, to better frame the problem that we're trying to solve. You should next identify the nature of the question. What type of a question are you asking? Is it one of these observational questions? Is it explanatory? Is it a system question? Or is it an engineering question? Are you asking questions to better frame the problem that we're trying to solve? And then the the third part of a good question is it can it be empirically tested? Can we gather data to answer that question? Questions like is it beautiful or is it wonderful? A lot of those we can't answer those questions in science. And so I've developed a graphic organizer. You could download it below. Um, I like to put them in these little dry erase uh, folders so the students can start writing their questions on it. It's a graphic organizer, so you should use it at the beginning, but eventually it should evaporate. And so when you're getting kids to ask questions, you want to start with some kind of a phenomena. So the one I'm going to use in this video is the drinking bird. It's a classical toy. It's a classical science uh, investigation, but most people don't understand how it works. And in fact, Einstein looked at it the first time and really couldn't figure out what was going on. First thing you want to do is give them a phenomena and give them time to start asking questions. The first one will come easy, but if it doesn't, give them that first question to get them started. Like, why do these birds keep drinking? And then give them time and uh, something to look at so they can start asking those questions. The best thing to look at would be the actual bird, but if you can't do that, we've got a video. I'll put a link to this video down below of these drinking birds, and I want you to just start asking questions or have your students ask questions. It'll take a second for them to get into that um, kind of a mode of wondering. Uh, this is better than just having them observe. They want to frame that ob observations in a question that you can kind of share with someone else. And so 
I would take a second, if you don't know how this works, to write down a bunch of questions that you might have or pause the video and write down questions you have. But I'm gonna show you what to do with those questions once you bring those back together. So first, brainstorm those questions. I would encourage you to have your students do that individually. And then we can start to share those questions with other students. So these would be typical questions that students might ask. Would it work without the cup? Is there a valve under the head? First thing you wanna do is then classify those questions. Remember for it to be a good question, it should help us understand or better explain the phenomena. So do any of these questions here help us, uh, or don't, do any of them not help us understand the phenomena? I think the last one, like how much do they cost, doesn't really help us understand the phenomena, and so I would say that's not a good question. I think one of the worst things we can do is tell kids any question you ask is a good question, that's not true. The wondering is good, but the way the question is written might not be that great. Now, if you're really getting started on classifying questions, I can't recommend the question formulation technique enough. Here's a website, it's called therightquestion.org. You can go there and they have protocols for asking questions. What they do is have the kids brainstorm questions and then classify those questions as either open-ended questions or closed-ended questions. So a closed-ended question, you could answer with a yes or a no or a word or two. So if we were to go through the questions that are asked, the first one, is an open-ended question. The second one, since I could answer it with just a yes or a no, is a closed-ended question. So if we go through those questions, we can classify what type of question you're asking. Now, lots of times students will ask me at this point, which of the questions are better, open-ended or closed-ended? And the answer to that is neither. Um, sometimes a question can be too open-ended, like the first one is, it's really gonna be hard to test that question. It's too open-ended. But if we look at like this one, it's too closed-ended. Like what's in the cup? It's gonna be really easy to figure that out. And it's probably gonna require me to ask that student a follow-up question. Like what do you think is in the cup? And lots of times they'll know more than was included in the question itself. And so they might say there's alcohol in the cup or water in the cup that causes some evaporation. And so what I would say is can we make that closed-ended question an open-ended question to improve the quality of the question that you're asking? So I, I would look at the question formulation technique. They've got a lot of resources you could look at in asking questions, but I found in science, it's more important to classify those questions according to what the cross-cutting concept is. There are really seven different ways we can wonder in science, and those are represented by these seven different cross-cutting concepts. So how does it keep drinking? That would be a cause and effect question. What about the next one? Would it work without the cup? That's looking at cause and effect as well. Is there a valve under the hat? That'd be structure and function. Now, it's really easy for me to classify these questions according to the cross-cutting concept but it wasn't when I started doing this. And it's really the only time I, as a teacher, was able to understand the value and what these cross-cutting concepts were. And so what I would encourage you to do is have the kids ask a bunch of questions, and then you try to classify what type of questions these are based on the cross-cutting concepts. And what you'll find is they're generally just gonna ask questions about cause and effect, structure and function, and what are the parts of the system itself. And so you wanna then ask questions outside that realm. So energy and matter, what's an energy or matter question you could ask? Well, where does the energy come from that's driving these birds? That's a fundamental question to why this, uh, how this phenomena works. Or maybe scale, proportion, and quantity. Would this work? if the birds were 10 meters tall or half the size. And so each time we ask a new question with a new cross-cutting concept, it allows us to look at that phenomena in a different way. And so you would really aspire to have your kids be able to ask questions in each of these seven different categories, but it's gonna take you a while to get to that point. Now, once they've done that, what we wanna do is look at those questions and say, are they testable or not? So could I gather data to actually answer those questions? A good way to think about that is could you hand the question with the material, the bird and the cup, to someone and could they gather data on that? So this first question, how does it keep drinking? I don't think that's a testable question at this point. It's not specific enough. Whereas the next one is. And you can go through the list and figure out which ones are testable, which ones are not testable. And then we can improve the questions to make sure that they're testable. So if we're looking at, for example, this one, where does the energy driving the bird come from? That's not specific enough. I couldn't give that question to somebody to help them answer and have them kind of come up with data. And so let me make that more specific. It could be, does the energy that drives the fluid up the bird come from the momentum of the bird? 
So that's a testable question. You've almost got an independent and a dependent variable there, and they could come up with an investigation based on that. And so asking questions is one of those fundamental parts to do in scientific inquiry. It's how we wonder, and then next thing we're going to do is start to come up with explanations, which is how we think. But when you're forming those questions, the most valuable thing you could look at would be the cross-cutting concepts. If you look at the inquiry cards, on the back of the inquiry cards, I've got a bunch of questions that you could ask. I've also got a bunch of the cross-cutting concept cards with questions on the back. These are all framing questions. They're ways that you can frame that phenomena in a way that'll make it more understandable. But probably the most important thing that you do with questions is that after you've improved them is that you value them. So this is a uh, bulletin board from a kindergarten teacher. She took all the questions that the kids had and they put them on a wonder wall. Or uh, Sarah English, she's a chemistry teacher in New York, is going to use this this fall. She's got a driving question board. And what she's going to have the kids do is ask their questions and then put them on the board where they think they fit. Is it a pattern type question? Is this a cause and effect? So you're really making them think not only about what are they wondering, but how are they wondering? And so that's asking questions. I think it's really important that we give our kids practice. We give them rubrics and then give, give them time to improve their question asking. But it's really the fundamental first step to inquiry and I hope that was helpful.